What is this camera doing here? Yo, Austin, when are you gonna shoot this review? You've literally had this phone for like three months. Don't you think it's about time to shoot the review? Austin, hello? Austin? 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 School sucks. What's up guys, Austin here, and today I have the OnePlus One. The two? No. I've had this phone for a while and I've been meaning to make a review of it for the longest time, but here it is. This is the best value phone on the market, hands down. Had this review come out a couple weeks ago, I probably would have said it was the best Android phone you could buy, but it's still pretty good. So what's the deal with this phone? What makes it so special? Well, for one, it's a nicely spec phone for the price, which we'll get into later, but it's also just built up a ton of hype. Still, one of the worst things about this phone is that it's hard to buy. OnePlus is a private smartphone manufacturer in China that barely pays anything in advertising, which allows them to have an extremely low price for a flagship phone. But because of scaling issues, OnePlus set up a very annoying invite system that requires you to have an invitation just to throw your money at them. They're moving towards a pre-order system, but because the demand of the phone is still so high, it hasn't really worked out nearly as smoothly as they wanted it to. With all that said, while it is a great phone, it's still tough to get your hands on one. So now with all those politics out of the way, we can go ahead and get into the phone. You can get a 16 gigabyte silk white version for 299, but you're gonna wanna go for the 64 gigabyte sandstone black version, which is just $50 more. I've talked about the textured back in a previous video. It feels interesting, a little rough, but I've found that with time, it starts to feel better and overall a lot softer, uh, but you still get a good grip, which is important since it's such a large device. The OnePlus One has a 5.5 inch 1080p panel with very large bezels on both the top and bottom of the phone, which makes the device kind of huge, I'm not gonna lie. Anyways, the display, it's good. It's not quad HD or anything, but it still looks great even on a 5.5 inch screen size. There's one thing I've gotta throw out here though. They bragged a lot about the IPS screen being able to respond to even the slightest of touches because of the thin gap between the touch sensor and the display panel. Well, it's awful. Honestly, it's probably the worst thing about the phone in my opinion. So for starters, this is the worst typing experience I've had ever on a phone. Luckily, it's been mostly fixed through a software update, but I couldn't stand typing on it. The screen was just way too sensitive and it either just didn't pick up everything I was typing or it would add a few extra characters in there that I barely touched, which didn't really help when I wanted to type fast. Also, this phone supports touch gestures, so you can double tap the phone when the display is off to wake it up, draw a circle to open up the camera, swipe two fingers down to play or pause music, and draw a V to turn on the dual LEDs. And for the most part, they all worked pretty well, except for the fact that they also worked when they were in my pocket. I had to disable most of the gestures because I ran into too many cases where the display would just activate in my pocket or the camera would turn on or the light would start shining just because the display was so sensitive. They're all great features, but they just didn't work as well as they should have. Just about everything else about the phone is great though. The internals are all top of the line. It has a quad core Snapdragon 801 processor and three gigs of RAM, which make it fly. As far as benchmarks go, it's up there with the best of the best. The performance is mostly comparable to the Galaxy S5, which again, for the price of the phone, is unbelievable performance. I believe a good reason for that is the software. It's running CyanogenMod, which is based on Android 4.4.4, and it's about as clean as the devices you can buy. It comes with absolutely no bloatware, no unnecessary apps, and it's really a nice and clean Android experience. For those of you who love to customize though, this is CyanogenMod, and the possibilities are basically endless. There's a theme showcase that make it easy to change just about every aesthetic feature of Android. You can change the icon pack, the style, the sound pack, even the boot animation. This is the most easily customizable Android you can get right now, at least in terms of software. You can even change some of the hardware features too. For example, if you prefer on-screen buttons, you can use those, or you can use the built-in capacitive buttons if you want more screen real estate, although they are extremely dim for some reason. Now, speaking more on hardware, the camera. Now this is a 13 megapixel shooter with an f2.0 aperture, and it's a good camera. The quality is not the best I've ever seen on a camera, but it's still good enough for day-to-day -day use. My only big complaint is that the camera is a little slow. And don't get me wrong, I don't think the camera was always this slow. I mean, the front-facing camera is still pretty fast, but for some reason, I think I'm, I'm able to turn off the HDR mode, and the camera spends most of the time processing three images every shot. It might just be my specific phone, but aside from that, the camera has some pretty good features. 
There's an option to capture in a raw image data format, and as far as video recording, you can record in slow motion as well as in 4K. It's important to note that there are actually two 4K options. There's your standard UHD, which is 3840 by 2160, which technically isn't 4K. And then there's DCI 4K, which is true 4K, and that comes in at 4096 by 2160. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is the battery life. It's fantastic. It has a 3100 milliamp hour battery, and honestly, I think it's the longest lasting battery I've used on a smartphone. I've never ran into an instance where I felt compromised by the battery life. Even on days when I forgot to charge it overnight, I was still able to get through most of the second day and easily get a day and a half out of usage out of this battery. Some people might not like that it's non-removable, but you're going to get some great battery life out of this, so you wouldn't even need to switch it out as much anyways. So is this really a flagship killer? Is this a device that never truly settles? Well, some might argue that it does settle for no expandable storage, no removable battery, and no wireless charging, but for a $350 price point, it's really hard to complain about anything. This is the best phone you could buy this price point, period. So with all that said, that is my review of the OnePlus One, definitely one of my favorite phones of the year and the best value phone on the market right now, that is if you're able to buy one yourself. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and leave a comment down below letting me know what you guys think of the phone. As always, be sure to subscribe to my channel to catch all of my latest updates. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you in my next video.